Well, it looks like I'm finally getting around to making part two to my feather video. If you didn't watch my previous video on feathers, you might want to check it out just so that way you'll be all caught up with us. So far, we've taken a good look at the family tree of dinosaurs. But before we dig deeper, I'd like to take a step back and look at an earlier time. We're going to take a moment to look at the Earth's very first vertebrate animal to evolve to fly, pterosaurs. They first appeared during the Triassic period, around 215 million years ago. It can be difficult to imagine, but they thrived for over twice as long as they've been extinct, which only occurred about 65 million years ago. So why am I bringing these guys up? Well, we've got even more feathers to talk about here. Most or all pterosaurs had hair-like filaments known as pycnofibers. These were dense filaments, but not very comparable to mammalian hair by any means. In 2018, a study showed that some pterosaur pycnofibers had branching structures, just like early stages of feathers. The study stated that they had found four distinct types of these pycnofibers covering different parts of the animal's bodies. In fact, just within the last month, a pterosaur with plumage on the back of its head was in the news. The melanin that was preserved in the rock indicates that this specimen had at least two kinds of feathers that were different colors. T. imperator is a pterosaur that is most recognizable for its massive head crest, which are remarkably well preserved in the fossils from Brazil's Crato formation. On this latest specimen, some of the feathers on the back of the head were short and wiry, while others branched out, similar to that of some of the dinosaurs we looked at in the first part of my series. As for the colors of them, we can look to modern birds. We know that long, slender melosomes are associated with black and darker colors. Then more ball-shaped ones are usually associated with ginger colors. The team determined that most likely the branching feathers were lighter in color, while the shorter hairs would have been darker. While not everyone has gotten on board with this idea just yet, if it's proven to be true, feathers this far back in the family tree hints that feathers were shared by the last common ancestor between pterosaurs and dinosaurs. This would also imply that most, if not all, dinosaurs started off with some kind of a fluffy coat before select groups like giant sauropods evolved without them. So real quick, let's take another look at this tree. If we have feathers starting all the way back here before the dinosaurs even evolved, then it's completely reasonable to say that all dinosaurs have the possibility of being feathered. This is an example of phylogenetic bracketing, where we can examine the relatives of some dinosaurs and then infer certain traits based on what we know to be true about their other relatives. A common comparison you'll hear is that even though we have no fossil evidence on extinct mammals having hair, we're still pretty sure that they had it since that's a trait of other mammals. So after reviewing all of this, let's finally take a look at Tyrannosaurus. Now, obviously, this is a dinosaur that most of us are used to seeing all big and scaly, but what about some of its closest relatives? Delong is a great example of an early Tyrannosaur with feathers. They existed over 40 million years before T. rex even did, and we have direct evidence of Delong having feathers. These feathers can be seen near the jaw and tail, these being simple proto-feathers. But we also have impressions of scales, once again proving that dinosaurs can have multiple skin coverings. 
This small, early relative of T. rex was the first tyrannosaur found with direct evidence for feathers. Another tyrannosaur with fossilized feathers would be Eutyrannus. We have a variety of preserved feathers from this one, from long ones up to 7.9 inches long, to small, filamentous feathers. And believe me, this one was absolutely covered in these. The pelvis, near the feet, the neck, upper arm, and so on. Now, while these weren't flight feathers, they could have helped with insulation for a cool climate, or even just for display purposes. With this evidence alone, it can be inferred that at least some tyrannosaurs were feathered, as were most, if not all, theropod dinosaurs at some stage in their life. And once again, this does include T. rex. Sadly, we currently have no direct evidence for this one yet. Just remember that lacking the fossils for it doesn't conclusively mean lacking feathers. Tissue like feathers are only preserved in the fossil record under specific circumstances. As Steve Brevat of the University of Edinburgh said, just because we don't see them doesn't mean they weren't there. So, without direct evidence for T. rex, how can we know they possibly had fluffy covering? Well, just take a look at the evidence we have in support of feathers. I find it hard to believe that after finding even some feathering on T. rex's relatives, that they would simply be naked. I'm once again going to stress that this is just how phylogenetic bracketing works. Another important question is, were they fully covered? Hmm, probably not. As we've seen in other dinosaurs, it's not uncommon to have some scales as well. Perhaps they had scaly tails like Coolinda dromius, or scaly feet and arms. They might have even looked like giant ostriches, with a mix of feathers, scales, and naked skin. Which leads me into another point to make, in opposition to one popular theory. Some people imagine T. rex as being a fluffy juvenile, only to lose the feathers as they age and grow scales as an adult. That makes sense when we look at today's large land animals such as elephants, hippos, and rhinos. They don't possess fur as that makes them too insulated for warmer climates, and larger animals don't need to create excessive heat. However, this argument does fall flat when you remember that these are mammals, not birds. Even to this day, no bird species has completely lost their feathers. Emus, cassowaries, and ostriches do just fine in regulating temperature. These feathers actually help them keep cool, believe it or not. It's not unreasonable to theorize that Tyrannosaurus kept their feathers for this purpose, and the biggest ones could be estimated to be up to 40 feet long and 12 feet high. That would be one big ostrich. Going back to the idea that they grew scales after shedding feathers, well, we just don't have the evidence. While nothing can compare to the wonders of dinosaurs, no living bird has ever grown scales after molting their feathers. Even though they are similar genetically, we don't see any creature fully replacing feathers with scales. Scales can grow beside feathers, but they don't exist underneath them. If anything, a T. rex that loses their feathers should have only naked skin underneath, not scales. While I'll admit that would be hilarious and scary to see, I just don't see why when feathers aid in thermoregulation. Realistically, a T. rex with a combination of feathers, scales, and maybe some naked skin seems to be the most viable option. 
Before we end this episode, I thought it would be important to bring up the evidence in favor of scales for T-Rex. I, of course, am referring to the Y-Rex specimen. At this time, we do have evidence of scales on the ilium, tail, and neck from the Y-Rex specimen. The number of inches that we have of scales are relatively small for an animal that was 40 feet long. We've also got some fossilized skin of Albertosaurus, another relative of T-Rex. Once again, it's only a few inches, but it's better than nothing. One patch was found with the Gastralia ribs, so this most likely being from the underside of the animal. Still, the evidence is hardly conclusive of anything other than T-Rex doesn't appear to have been entirely covered in feathers. Please note the word entirely. I wanted to bring up these scale impressions to try and make this more than just a one-sided argument from my end. Until further evidence is found, we can't definitively say that they were fully covered in scales. Yes, it's amazing that we even found scale impressions, but so far these have been found in areas of the body that we already knew some dinosaurs had scales on. Things like the tail and the underside is actually common to be scaly, so it's not a surprise to see this. Will we find more evidence in the future? It's possible, so I hope it's something we can all review together sometime in the future. Well guys, I hope you find this kind of stuff as interesting as I do. I've loved getting to watch the study of dinosaurs gradually evolve over time. Pun intended. I'd love to do more thorough deep dives like this again sometime soon. Thank you guys for watching this week's video. I'd love to know if you want me to keep making content like this. Or maybe if you want me to do something like discussing specific dinosaurs or random topics instead. Feel free to comment down below and maybe consider giving this video a like if you learned anything new. Thanks so much again for watching this and I'll see you all next time.